Okay, investors, the gloves are off for this one. It's probably not going to be a fair fight, but we're still going to throw them in the ring and see what happens. In the red corner, we have the United States of America, eagle-eyed, soaring high in the sky, ready to pounce on any attackers at a moment's notice. And Hello there. over in the blue corner, we have the United Kingdom. Some guy sat drinking his tea, some crumpets on the side, and oh, he's not done any stretching. In this video, we're going to put our imaginary fighters through their paces to answer the question about where you should be investing your hard-earned money. Do you go all in with the US or park it here in the UK? Oh, and also, does it matter if you're from the UK or from the US in the first place? These are all things we'll consider in this video, as well as getting to the bottom of explaining what the differences are in the kinds of companies that you can invest in. So by the end, you'll be in a much better position whether you want to build out your own investment portfolio or you might want to look at some changes and how it currently looks. First up, let's weigh these two markets up against each other. I know this one might not be the fairest fight, but we'll give them both a good chance. To keep things simple, I'm going to use the S&P 500 index from the US and the FTSE 100 index here in the UK as all of our benchmarks, and hopefully that will make things nice and easy. From a bird's eye view, the US economy is the largest in the world, currently valued around $25 trillion, which is around a quarter of the entire planet's GDP. Running up behind is China, Japan, Germany, and then the UK at a whopping $3.4 trillion. Hey, not bad for a little island of the North Sea. So what about the stock markets then? Well, let's take a look and zoom in a bit. Leading the charge is the S&P 500, probably one of the most famous indexes in the world. It tracks the 500 largest companies listed in the United States. It's got a total market cap of around $13.5 trillion and includes some of the biggest companies in the world like Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, and Tesla. From a UK standpoint, the FTSE 100 weighs in at around $2.2 trillion or 1.9 trillion pounds at the current rubbish exchange rate, which is definitely a topic for later on in the video. Now, as much as in your personal life, does size really matter? Before you answer that one, we're talking about investing here. Stop it. Think about this. In the UK, the best selling cars yet again are the Vauxhall Corsa, which I think might not even have an equivalent in the US. In most states, you'd probably be chased out and told to buy a proper car. Compare that to the US, where the best selling car isn't even a car, is the Ford F Series. Something like this uh, Ford F 150. They've sold more than 25 million across their life. However, as investors, we're not interested in current sales or size or how high up on the road we can be. We're interested in future returns. So where are we going to get them from? Let's dive a little deeper into what kinds of companies we get when we invest in the US or the UK. Starting in the UK, the FTSE 100 is very different from the S&P 500. Look at the kinds of companies that make up the top list. Check this out on screen now. Here's the 10 largest companies in the UK by market cap. I'm sure you recognize a lot of the names, but it's certainly no Apple and Microsoft. There's no technology companies to be found, and the largest company, AstraZeneca, is in the pharmaceutical industry. Outside of that, you've got loads of oil and gas companies, as well as mining and then consumer companies like Diageo, who make brands like Johnny Walker and Guinness, when you want to have a little tipple. And there's even British American tobacco here too. No surprise what they do. Funny this, if you live in the UK, you'd think that with a list like that, everyone must work on some oil field or in some quarry, or maybe producing booze and tobacco, but actually, it couldn't be further from the truth. You see, the FTSE 100 doesn't really represent what the people actually do in the UK or the UK economy very well. For example, AstraZeneca employs about 70,000 staff, yet in the UK there's just about over 10% of that many people who actually work for the company. Likewise, for companies like Rio Tinto and British American Tobacco, all of the production and mining is certainly not done on this little island where the sun doesn't shine too much. It's done all over the rest of the world in Australia, South America and the rest of Europe. Now compare that to the S&P 500, where companies like Apple have 150,000 employees, where more than 90,000 work in the US, and companies like Tesla, which also have a huge number of employees based inside the same country as the stock market where they're actually listed on. While we're on this topic and looking closely at the US market, check out how the S&P 500 is made up. It's completely different from the UK. The largest companies all fall into the technology sector and healthcare, and between those two sectors alone, that accounts for nearly 40% of all of the weightings in the index. So if you choose to invest in the US compared to the UK, you're basically all in on technology. Forget about the old giants, that's the only way forward, right? Now, while we're talking about old giants, one major consideration here worth pointing out is that with old established companies, one plus point you could tend to get, at least here in the UK from the FTSE 100, is dividends. 
Some investors love them and some hate them, especially if you're not using tax-free investing accounts. A totally different subject, but make sure you're making the most of them, whether that's a stocks and shares ISA here in the UK or your Roth IRA over in the States. The FTSE 100 has a strong history of paying quite a large chunk of dividends out to its shareholders. So there's lots of quite happy retirees and pension funds out there who enjoy getting their income paid from them, regardless of how high inflation is or whether or not the Federal Reserve is going to raise interest rates. The current yield of the FTSE 100 is about 3.5%, which means that for every $100 or pounds you've got invested, you'll get around $3.50 or £3.50 each year. In the past, it's also been higher, whereas from the S&P 500, the current yield is sat around 1.7%, meaning that you'll want to have a lot more cash invested if you're gonna live on those dividends alone. However, as you'll know, that's only one part of the story. Dividends come from the profits that companies make and get taken from their balance sheet, so it's not exactly free money. As investors, what we really want to know is where am I going to get the best returns, regardless of whether it's cash in my pocket or the value of my shares? Well, let's take a look at some long term performance before we touch on a very important point next. Although we can't tell the future, let's at least have a little look back at the chart to give us some perspective. On screen now, I'm going to look back and see how the FTSE 100 has done against the S&P 500. I've used two ETFs here. I'm going to choose SBY for the US and EWU for the FTSE 100, which seems to be the closest US-based ETF I can find that you could invest in from that side of the pond. Now, starting with $10,000, but this could equally just be pounds, here's what the past has looked like. And let me tell you now, clearly things don't look very good for the UK. Going back to 1996 and following through all the way until today, the S&P 500 has torn the old UK to pieces. And yes, before you say anything, both of these charts include all of the dividends being reinvested, which is really, really important. As you can see, if you were invested from the late 90s with just a single deposit, you'd have nearly $90,000 with the S&P 500 and just 26,000 if you went all UK. That's a huge difference in your investing portfolio. And just for fun, if you didn't reinvest your dividends, here's what would have happened. 55,000 versus 10,000. Almost all of the returns from the UK market have come from those dividends being reinvested. So your initial $10,000 deposit has basically stayed the same. And let's not even start to talk about inflation. If you're enjoying the video so far, please do me a huge favor and hit the like button for me. And why not subscribe? It helps out small channels like mine try and make videos where I make stupid boxing analogies fit into investing. Anything to make it exciting, right? All right, just before you think it's an open and shut case for your investment decision and the poor old UK is left battered and bruised in the middle of the ring, there's life in the old dog yet. You see, here's where we need to think smart as investors and not get ourselves trapped in only looking at the past performance. Remember that small print about past performance not being a reliable indicator for future results? Well, it's there for a reason, and here's why. If you know anything about the stock market, you know that things tend to go in big swings and cycles. So for a certain period of time, you'll go through boom period, and then all of a sudden you'll be in a bust period. Kind of like how investors in Peloton feel. That joke was too easy. Anyway, where was I? Right, booms and busts. So after periods of big double digit growth for the year before, it's harder to keep sustaining the same levels of growth every single year. What ends up happening is we revert back to the average. Let me pull up some interesting data for you. On this chart, we can see how international stocks have performed versus US stocks over a really long period of time. Every time the blue lines are above the middle line, this means that US stocks have beaten the rest of the world in their returns. And this goes all the way back to 1975. You can see how it's kind of gone in cycles where the US performs really well, and then international stocks have had their time to shine, like in the late 1980s and early 1990s, as well as after the great financial crash of around 2008. Now you can see that up until now, the most recent data in the US has been crushing it still after all the post-pandemic stock market boom that we've seen. The current cycle has lasted longer than 10 years, and the average length of performance is around 7.8 years. So does this mean that the tide is about to turn again for international? Honestly, nobody knows, but it's just something worth being aware of. It's really hard to keep growing at a fast pace for a long period of time. I mean, think about companies like Apple and Walmart. They try to grow by 20% a year when they're already the largest companies in the world or the biggest generator of revenue. That's really, really difficult. Okay, what about currency? This could be a subject of an entire video itself, but us investors have to make sure that we at least know the basics. So if you're based in the US and you invest in the S&P 500, then you're mostly not worried. Your companies make your money in dollars, you spend your dollars, and they're the global reserve currency, and important commodities like oil are all traded in dollars. However, you still might get a little bit affected by global exchange rates. If your dollar is too strong, like it's getting now, it might be great for going on holiday and getting more pounds or euros in your pockets, or even for importing the latest stuff from China. But then don't forget, it's not great if you're trying to sell your products to the rest of the world. 
it ends up costing your customers more, which may cause them to reduce the amount they spend, lowering your sales and potentially your profits too. Investing across the pond either way, things can get more interesting, but really for us in the UK, we definitely have more to worry about. And in fact, it really doesn't matter if we invest in the S&P 500 or the FTSE 100, we actually have a lot of exposure to the changing rates of money. Funny enough, like we said earlier about the FTSE 100 being a strange list of companies that doesn't really represent the UK economy, well, they generate most of their sales in US dollars. So every time the pound is weak, we can actually benefit from increase in sales and we'll get more pounds paid out in dividends from them. Of course, it can also work out in reverse too, so when the pound is strong, it might have a negative effect on earnings made in dollars. Either way, we really can't escape it here, so my opinion would just be to play it over the long term and accept that sometimes it will work out well and other times it will work out worse. However, one trick you can use is look into hedged index funds, which are available for both UK and US investors, but I'll leave that for a subject in another video. For now though, just be aware of it and know that any investing made is going to be affected by those exchange rates, so they affect both of our fighters. Okay, so are we closer to deciding what the best market is and where you should put your money as an investor? Well, maybe, but like we've said before, we don't know the future and that's where the real answer lies. If we could time travel forward 20 or 30 years, I could go and get the solid answer, but until then, we've really just got to guess. Clearly, the two markets are very different and hold lots of very different kinds of companies. If you're looking to build up long-term wealth, then you won't go far wrong just dollar cost averaging into a low cost index fund every single month or week whenever you get paid. And you just keep doing that regardless of what the global economy does. Some of you might be attracted to the UK dividends and some of you might be more attracted to those fast gains of the tech giants over in the US. Really, it all depends on where you think the growth will be. Funny enough, recently we might even be seeing a world where we get less global and more focus is being put on more self-sufficient and trading less internationally. Clearly countries like the US will be in a better position than the UK where we've got to import lots of different things like food and energy just to keep going. However, can I let you into a little secret? What if the real idea behind this video was to show you that you don't really have to choose one or the other? Although I personally have most of my investments in the S&P 500, there's nothing stopping me from having both of them. And while I'm here, why not just do the same thing with the rest of the world? Rather than guess who's going to have the best returns in the future, why not just own the entire stock market so you'll earn the returns no matter where they come from? Isn't that the whole beauty of investing? The red corner and the blue corner can both be good bets in this imaginary fight. For US investors, you could choose investments like VT rather than just VOO, which would allow you to invest globally. Or you could add in some EWU like we spoke about earlier, which gives you some FTSE 100 and add that into your ETF portfolio. Then from the UK perspective, rather than just investing in a Vanguard S&P 500 fund like VUSA, which is the one I really like, why not add in some VUKE or even one step further, choosing something like VWRL or the FTSE Global All Cap Mutual Fund. You don't have to choose one or the other and the best one will only be found if we could time travel and report back. We don't know where we're going from here in terms of future returns, truly anything could happen. So either stick with your own plan, keep investing for the long run, mix and match whatever works for you or just own the entire world in one global fund. Basically, the world is your oyster, it's up to you. Okay, ring the bell already referee, our fight is getting a little tired, it's way past his bedtime. Let's get him another cup of tea and then off to bed. Anyway, with that sorted, enjoy this next video, leave a like on the way out and subscribe for many more. And as always, happy investing.